For the last 15 years, GPJC has been a consistent opponent of U.S. military intervention around the world, organizing educational events to counter the pro-war propaganda and demonization of peoples and their leaders. This violent and often racist rhetoric is designed to mask or excuse the violations of human rights and national sovereignty in pursuit of the U.S. imperialistic goals. GPJC has organized hundreds of demonstrations, rallies, vigils, petition and letter writing drives, as well as delegations to elected officials. From Iraq and Afghanistan to Libya and Syria, from Palestine to Venezuela to Cuba and now Korea, GPJC has offered the Atlanta community programs that provide an analysis that rejects U.S. militarism and war and promote justice and human rights. Tonight, we welcome back to Atlanta, Ajamu Baraka. For many years, Ajamu served here as the executive director of the U.S. Human Rights Network, and many of you, no doubt, met him in that capacity. Ajamu is an internationally recognized Pan-African human rights activist whose roots are in the Black Liberation Movement. As an organizer and activist, Ajamu's experience spans over four decades of domestic and international involvement. Currently, Ajamu serves on the board of Cooperation Jackson and is the national organizer of the Black Alliance for Peace that was just launched this year. Finally, Ajamu is an editor and contributing columnist for the Black Agenda Report and contributing columnist for Counterpunch Magazine. In his capacity as a writer and geopolitical analyst, Ajamu has appeared on and been covered in a wide range of print, broadcast, and digital media outlets such as CNN, BBC, The Travis Smiley Show, Telemundo, ABC's World News Tonight, The Real News Network, Russia Today, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, and WRFG. <laughs> so, um, we have asked him to speak about Korea, bringing in the history of the foreign domination of Korea, the causes of the Korean War in 1950, and the ensuing 67 years of unrelenting U.S. hostility to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. A big ask, we know, but we are really confident that he's to the task. So Ajamo will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A discussion until 8.45. We need to be out of this building promptly by 9 o'clock, so I hope you all will help us do that. So please join me in welcoming Ajahn Barak. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, and thank all of you for uh, joining us this, this evening uh, for this very uh, timely and important conversation. Uh, before I get into the topic at hand, uh, specifically. Um, I think it's important to uh, provide a context for this situation that we are all concerned about as it relates to North Korea. Uh, we want to uh, start from what I believe is uh, the foundational point, at least uh, for me, in terms of understanding how we um, situate the current tensions between the U.S. and North Korea. For me, the, the point of departure for understanding North Korea is understanding U.S. history and the nature of the U.S. state. For me, the U.S. state is an instrument for a rapacious, white supremacist, violent, settler, colonialist, capitalist system, and a greedy, 
short-sighted ruling class. That's the nature of, of, the, of the beast that we are dealing with uh, today. And when one proceeds from that understanding that you are not confused by uh, the rhetoric coming from the two major political parties. You understand that there is, in fact, a convergence of interests uh, between those parties, that those parties emanate from this common history, this common commitment to the continuation of white supremacists, capitalists, colonialists, order. So we start off from that, that position. Uh, and when we start from that position, we understand that when you look at how we get to the situation with North Korea, you understand that the conflict that has characterized that relationship and which has intensified uh, over the last few years um, is all part of that commitment to maintain the dominance of the U.S. When you look at the strategies being pursued by the ruling elements here in this country, we have to recognize that uh, the predominant uh, strategy is informed by commitment to uh, what they call full spectrum dominance. Now basically what that means is that the U.S. is prepared to do what it needs to do to maintain its global superiority. It is a, a strategy that both parties have bought into. Both parties are in fact committed to. Uh, that with all of the conversation about the influence of the neoconservatives, we also know that that commitment is also reflected in the commitment coming from the liberal um, uh, interventionists. And we see the examples of, that, of those common interests in that common commitment all around us. We look at the, the death and destruction uh, coming out of the conflict with Iraq. We look at what has happened with the second longest conflict, which is the conflict in Afghanistan. This year, we're looking at, what, 16 years of conflict in that part of the world, with the possibility of uh, the continued occupation of that, of that state uh, for who knows how long. We know that uh, Senator Corker just said the other day uh, that uh, the U.S. Uh, will be there for another decade without a peep of opposition from anybody. And that followed the conversation or the comments made by, uh, by President Trump uh, when he announced that the, the U.S. was going to expand its presence uh, in Afghanistan and that the U.S. would be there for who knows how long without any opposition from the American people. And no opposition really from uh, what is supposed to be the, the loyal opposition within Congress and we're talking about uh, the Democrat Party. We saw what happened in, in uh, Liberia, Libya. We saw that basically you have both parties uh, in conjunction with the, uh, uh, the NATO gangsters uh, systematically destroy the most prosperous state on the African continent. And the consequence of that was the destabilization of states across the African continent. We know that the justification for that, that intervention was supposed to be based on our concern for the Libyan people. But as a consequence of that intervention by the U.S. and NATO, uh, upwards of almost 50,000 people ended up losing their lives. So the, the massacre that was supposed to be the justification for the intervention was in fact carried out by the NATO U.S. coalition. Again, we see that with this assault on this sovereign nation, there was very little opposition here in this country. We saw that both parties were in support of Obama's assault. And we see that because it appears that the American people, along with the uh, corporate sector, and the media are all in uh, alignment with their commitment to upholding the dominance of this system and the dominance of the white supremacist um, order. 
we have to ask ourselves, why is it that we have no real opposition from any kind of, of anti-war movement? Is it also because our interests are aligned with that objective? Why is it that it appears that the claim on the part of the state that its intervention is based on some kind of humanitarian concern seems to resonate with people, even with other left? So we have some very serious questions to, to address uh, when we take a look at the absence of any kind of real opposition here in this country to these, this, these military adventures. We look at the drone warfare, for example. Another example of the lack of any opposition, primarily because it appears that uh, because of Barack Obama uh, articulated a commitment to that as a a clean operational operation that was necessary. Uh, we see that even among uh, others who call themselves progressives, uh, people like Bernie Sanders, uh, that he can embrace uh, the drone warfare uh, position uh, and define himself as a, a progressive. And that definition was accepted by people. Even though it's quite clear that this drone warfare has resulted in the uh, uh, murder of over 4,000 innocent people. So we have the, these, this continuation of this collaboration among the really elements, among the media, with the support from large sectors of the, of the progressive left um, and uh, even some radicals here in this country. Syria, another case in point, where basically based on an argument uh, for humanitarian intervention, we have another assault on a sovereign nation that appears to have been supported and was supported by large sectors of the uh, left population in this country and large sectors of, of the population in general. Um, again, the justification being that the U.S. had a right and a responsibility to intervene uh, to save the lives of people um, and to support uh, some type of uh, progressive democratic change. For many left radicals in this country, their support for the Syrian intervention was um, in uh, alignment with the notion that there was some kind of revolutionary change taking place in that country that uh, leftists needed to support. And the list goes on and on and on. Yemen, I mean, it's absolutely incredible that um, that conflict that uh, could not occur without the active support of the U.S. continues. A conflict in the poorest uh, Arab state on the planet, a conflict that has resulted in what many people argue is one of the most serious humanitarian catastrophes on the planet, a conflict in which uh, the Saudis have been allowed to bomb and strafe and kill with basic impunity. A conflict that has resulted in massive destruction of the, infra of the infrastructure. A conflict that could not, again, occur and, and be uh, uh, executed without the direct support of the U.S. state. The naval blockade, uh, the, the assistance with targeting uh, of, for the Saudi bombing raids, all of these things took place uh, with the direct support uh, from, the, from the U.S. state. Egypt, we remember the revolution in Egypt. This marvelous revolution that was taking place in Egypt uh, against uh, Mubarak. Um, and we saw that there was the beginnings of a democratic process. Uh, but then we saw also that there was a coup. A coup that the U.S. basically supported. Uh, and no matter what your opinion may be of the Muslim Brotherhood, the fact of the matter is that there was a democratic process, uh, there was a coup, and according to U.S. law, uh, the Obama administration should have been able to suspend uh, aid to that nation state because of that coup. But of course, they failed to do that because it was not seen to be in the interest of the U.S. state uh, to in fact do that. Honduras, we've got to raise that. The fact that at the very beginning of the Obama administration, 
uh, the Obama administration gave a green light to the uh, coup in Honduras. AFRICOM, uh, with the destruction of the Libyan state, and we saw the aggressive expansion of the U.S. Uh, military in, uh, in, on the African continent, uh, in various countries across the uh, African continent. Uh, and Venezuela. We, we can't leave that off of this. Here we have a country that's attempting to uh, involve itself in a process where it will, is trying to address the historic uh, exploitation uh, and oppression uh, in that country as a consequence of being under military rule uh, and being part of the backyard of U.S. imperialism. Uh, they have found themselves in the crosshairs of aggressive U.S. policies. And even the liberal, again, the liberal Barack Obama uh, declared twice, you know, the last time right before he left office, that Venezuela was a, a national security threat. Now, what could be threatening about, about Venezuela? But that was the declaration, and that's been the foundation for the policies of the Trump administration, targeting uh, and continuing the subversion of Venezuela. And last but not least, I know this is a long list, but I think it's important to really comment on all of these examples, and they even, they're even more, the Ukraine. The Ukraine is important because not only was it a coup that was um, supported um, and even really initiated uh, by the U.S. But, you know, our concerns today about the rise of the radical right in this country, you know, we have to remind ourselves that with the support for the coup in Ukraine, the o Obama administration was actively collaborating with some of the most violent right-wing elements on the European continent. That basically, you know, this was a right-wing coup that uh, strengthened and emboldened the right wing really across the uh, European continent. So these are examples of the conversion of interests. The fact that when we talk about uh, Trump, you know, we are not talking about something that's, that's new. That's why, why for me, I reject this, this um, uh, focus on what many people are calling um, uh, anti-Trumpism. For me, anti-Trumpism is a, is a trick. It's a diversion. We have to be concerned about uh, Donald Trump and the social forces that he represents. But I'm more concerned about the, the continuity in U.S. policies, the continuity in the, the class interests involved, the fact that we have a right wing that is in power, and that is the, the ruling class that's at the base of the neoliberal capitalist order. That for me is the right wing. That for me it is representative of the right wing politics that we have to mobilize and organize against. So for me, anti-Trumpism is a, is, is a, a, a dead end politics uh, that only props up uh, the legitimacy of the existing order. So this is the context for me as we move to the question and the issue for tonight. And, and that is uh, North Korea. Uh, and North Korea is a, is a very interesting and really tragic situation. Um, when we look at the situation with North Korea, and we know how North Korea has been framed in the popular press, um, they have been framed as um, being under the, the control of these unstable political forces with this maniac who's supposed to be uh, running the state. But you know, uh, people like uh, John Pilger says that the issue of North Korea is not uh, North Korea, but the problem uh, between North Korea and the United States is in fact the United States. That what we have with the conflict with North Korea is the fact that we have a situation in which the war that was uh, uh, waged against that country has never ended. That we have a situation where uh, 
in North Korea is finding themselves um, in the continued crosshairs of U.S. aggression. And the, the examples we just touched on with Libya and with uh, Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq, those lessons have not been lost on the North Koreans. They are completely clear that if they had not uh, created a deterrence, that they would have been probably attacked and destroyed by now. So that's the basis of, of this conflict today. But let's go back and take a look at how this conflict uh, evolved. Because when you look at this North Korean conflict, again, you put this in the context of, of U.S. policies and the hegemonic uh, position of the, of the U.S. state uh, after the end of the Second World War. The conflict in North Korea had a, a couple of um, interesting uh, objectives. Um, the U.S. created that conflict in Korea uh, because it's always been um, a money maker. In fact, um, the, the conflict uh, was the first um, example of the U.S. Attempt, attempting to try to uh, revive the economy after the end of the war. Uh, Christine Hall points out that the Korean conflict helped to rehabilitate the U.S. economy, a U.S. economy that was geared toward uh, war production. That basically, um, it was seen as an opportunity to stimulate the post-war economy. Uh, Democrat President uh, Truman, and I always identify these uh, presidents by their our party affiliation, especially when they are Democrats, because we have this mythology that uh, the Democrats are the ones that have been uh, soft uh, on, on war and, and doves and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, but it, uh, Democrat President uh, Truman tripled U.S. defense spending uh, leading up to the uh, Korean conflict. Uh, the conflict also provided a rationale for the bilateral linking of Asian client states to the United States. It helped to establish what uh, Congress Johnson called an empire of bases in the Pacific. And to show you the importance of the Korean conflict as it was developing, General James Van Fleet, the commanding officer, officer of UN forces in Korea, described the war as, quote, a blessing, unquote. He further remarked, quote, there had to be a Korean conflict, either here or a conflict like this, some other place in the world. That basically, the, the, the necessity for the U.S. economy was that it needed to have conflict in order to uh, rehabilitate, revive the post-war economy. And as always, when you have these kinds of, of, of global conflicts that the U.S. is involved in, it has a domestic component. This was the period of the beginning of those gigantic defense budgets, and it was also the time that we had the development of the national security state. So the Korean conflict emerged alongside Carthyism uh, and the war being waged against the left uh, in the U.S. So the conflict itself. We were talking right before the, the uh, event this evening with some people, and, and you know, many people in this country don't realize how uh, terrible that conflict was. The fact that upwards up to 30% of the Korean population was wiped out. That the U.S. engaged in, in corporate bombing. That every aspect of the civilian infrastructure was destroyed. That even someone like General McArthur, uh, a uh, hero of the uh, Second World War, 
testified in Congress uh, that uh, the, uh, what he saw in Korea uh, was the most devastating war environment he had ever seen. This is the reality that the Koreans remember, the North Koreans remember, the complete and total devastation of their country that three years of war brought to them. So these understandings are fresh in their memories. When I had a chance to visit that country in 1989, um, we were taken to uh, one of the uh, war museums uh, in, in the country. And they presented the conflict from their point of view. Uh, and you could, you, you could see that that, that, that wound is still open. And because of the constant attempts to destabilize that country, this, the, the Korean people, the North Korean people have been on constant alert. They've been constantly mobilized to prepare themselves and to defend themselves uh, against what they saw as the inevitability of an attack, another attack from the U.S. state. So today, we have the war markings now uh, intensifying once again. Um, and again, this war markering has a political objective. You know, this notion of an unpredictable nuclear arm, North Korea, plays right into the racialized fears of the population and rationalizes the U.S. war machine's transfers of our money from the pockets of the people to the pimps in the military industrial complex. The conflict with North Korea is even more important today because of the fact that uh, in order to justify these massive uh, budgets, you have to have these external threats. Um, the Russians are part of that process, but the North Koreans uh, providing even more uh, attractive uh, target, if you will, to mobilize public opinion and to keep us thinking about the tremendous waste of resources toward uh, the military budget. This racist conception of North Korea and the role that it's playing um, has helped to justify the armed pivot to Asia. That policy change under the Obama administration uh, where they said that they were going to begin to uh, redirect their attention, their military attention to Asia. Why? Because of the emergence of, of China. And because uh, this ruling class is a ruling class that understands uh, that its uh, hegemony was the, uh, as a result of war monitoring, uh, they basically are committed to uh, uh, the possibility that before they will allow the Chinese to completely overtake them, uh, they will in fact, it appears, uh, engage in a military conflict with China. I mean, how else can you explain this pivot to Asia? So part of the North Korean conflict helps to justify uh, that pivot and to uh, provide for the American public a, a justification for why it's important uh, to support the pivot and these outrageous military uh, budgets. The point is that there, also, there are peaceful alternatives, that conflict is not inevitable, that uh, if you look at the evolution of this conflict between the U.S. Uh, and North Korea, you can see that there were various points where the conflict could have been resolved. Um, the North Koreans have repeatedly asked the U.S. to do something very simple. Sign a peace treaty that would bring the, the, the Korean War to, a, to an end. But the U.S. has, in fact, failed to do that. They have also, at various times, proposed that uh, the U.S. cease its annual war games with South Korea. We all know that 
uh, over the years, the uh, U.S. military engages in these massive war games with the South Koreans, supposedly for the defense of South Korea. But what they do in those war games is that they simulate an invasion of North Korea, an invasion and an occupation of North Korea. And they simulate the, what they call the decapitation of the North Korean leadership. They also uh, you know, simulate uh, and rehearse uh, how a preemptive nuclear strike might look. And the North Koreans understand this. They understand that these, these uh, uh, annual war games are, are serious and that their very existence is under attack as a consequence. So they have offered that if you're concerned about our nuclear program, we will freeze our nuclear program if you stop the annual uh, exercises. The Chinese also made the same offer. But every time the US has refused. In fact, what it appears is that uh, the US wants to try to uh, gain through intimidation what they couldn't gain through uh, warfare back in 1953. In 1994, there was a tentative deal between the North Koreans and uh, the Clinton administration. Uh, it was part of, of a multi-party uh, agreement uh, that, again, the idea would be that uh, the North Koreans would freeze any attempt to try to uh, build a nuclear capacity. But uh, that tentative agreement was uh, undermined with the uh, ascendancy of, of the Bush administration uh, in 2000. Uh, and we saw the same kinds of undermining of that agreement that we are seeing with the attempt to undermine the agreement between the U.S. and Iran. So what we have is uh, a, the continuation of U.S. aggression uh, that has now accelerated to a real uh, crisis at this point. And again, when we talk about uh, the recklessness of the uh, Trump administration, let's keep this in context. That basically the Trump administration is also still acting on and building off of uh, policies of the Obama administration. That it was the Obama administration that also rejected uh, this dual freeze, if you will, between uh, stopping uh, the, the nuclear program and the, and the annual uh, military uh, games. Um, and when he last rejected uh, talks with the North Koreans, that's when it became clear to North Koreans that they had to, to no other choice, basically, uh, but to go uh, aggressively forward. And that's when they announced, that's when they um, exploded, uh, exploded their largest nuclear device uh, last year, 20, uh, 2016. So we see consistently on the part of the U.S. authorities uh, undermining uh, the relationship between the U.S. and North Korea, undermining the possibility of peace um, to the extent that now we have a situation where uh, almost 60% of the population in the U.S. support the possibility of an armed encounter between the U.S. and North Korea. The people have been prepared, once again, to accept conflict between the U.S. and North Korea. And once again, we have a situation where uh, the uh, anti-war elements, or even the progressive elements in this country, uh, who normally you would, uh, would assume would, would, would oppose that, uh, where are they at? Why don't we have more people here this evening to talk about and to discuss and to strategize how we address this longest war? Why is it that we have a so-called leftist who will raise questions about whether or not uh, North Korea should be defended because of how the North Korean state and system is organized? What right do we have to determine how a state is organized? But that's what we have. So we have now the possibility of another conflict. You would think that more people would be outraged by uh, Trump's declaration that he's prepared to obliterate 
to, to completely destroy uh, North Korea. And we're talking about 23 million people. But we've had very little outrage. In fact, we've seen that, uh, again, because of the bipartisan support for war uh, and the, the corporate support for war, at the time when uh, Trump uh, makes these declarations, and in fact, we remember that when he slung those missiles towards Syria, uh, that at those moments, his popularity rises. So we are in a very dangerous situation right now. Uh, we have uh, pending uh, conflict. Uh, we've seen that the uh, Trump administration and before the Trump administration, the Obama administration has uh, imposed sanctions. Uh, they have engaged in isolation, uh, but they have not been able to um, bring this to a resolution because what they're asking from the North Korea, the North Korean people, is surrender. And that is not going to happen. So instead of in, engaging in serious diplomacy, uh, what we have is this language uh, and approach that says that the only way we address this issue is to continue the intimidation, more so called pressure with the real possibility that in the end, uh, there will be conflict. So my friends, we, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have to continue to uh, raise our voices against this madness. Uh, we have to be the ones to uh, say that it is absolute uh, uh, madness and immoral for public officials like Lindsey Graham to assure the American people that if there's war and conflict, if there's death and destruction, it won't be us dying. It'll be those people over there. Those kinds of conflict, kinds of comments cannot go unchallenged. But the very fact that they go unchallenged and that people are, and more people are now outraged is reflective of the kind of work uh, that we have to do. So we have to find a way to rebuild an effective anti-war movement in this country. And that is one of the reasons why we have been organizing the Black Alliance for Peace. We launched the Black Alliance for Peace uh, April the 4th of this year, um, the commemoration of the uh, 50th uh, anniversary of Dr. King's very famous speech in 1967. We broke with the uh, U.S. state uh, and came out in opposition to the Vietnam War. Uh, we thought that was a, a moment to begin the work of reviving the traditional black anti-war position here in this country. Uh, so we launched the Black Alliance for Peace. And our objective is to, is to reverse the uh, right-wing um, movement of our people, of black people, uh, toward an uncritical uh, support to U.S. imperialism. We, we saw that now with the ascendancy of Trump and more and more people coming out of this sort of fog, um, that now we had an opportunity to begin to rebuild, uh, to sharpen people's understanding uh, of what we're up against. And so we've been building this, uh, this process. Uh, our objective is to build the Black Alliance of Peace as one component of helping to revive the, the broader anti-war movement here uh, in this country. We are part of the United National Anti-War Coalition. Uh, in our short few months, we have uh, uh, done work and come out in opposition to the uh, destabilization efforts in Venezuela. Uh, we have been working on the North Korean situation. Uh, we have engaged uh, with UNAC in a week of action on Afghanistan. We are working with uh, Color Pink and a number of other organizations to uh, launch a campaign uh, this weekend. Uh, we're going to DC where we're going to launch the uh, divestment from, from the military uh, campaign. Uh, we're working on uh, with the US Peace Council and others a uh, campaign to, uh, to uh, close all US foreign bases and to uh, bring the, the, the US troops back to the US. Uh, we have done tremendous work uh, trying to educate people on uh, the situation in Colombia uh, and the peace process that 
uh, the Trump administration is attempting to undermine. Um, so we are doing what we can, that, can what we can do um, with our limited resources uh, and our very small organization. What we believe is absolutely necessary for us to engage in this kind of work. So my friends, we have the task before us uh, to work, uh, to continue to build, uh, to educate, uh, to, um, through our own example, demonstrate to other people that building an anti-war movement is absolutely critical and it is something that we in fact can do, that we have to do. Because if we don't build that movement, if we are not able to move more people to opposing um, U.S. intervention, U.S. imperialism, and then basically we are abdicating our historic responsibility to the people around the world. We have a strategic uh, imperative being here in this country to in fact do that. And that has to be the foundation of the message that we pose to the people of this country. Either you are in opposition to US imperialism or you are in fact a collaborator with this aggression. So my friends, let's continue to build and work and organize uh, and let's Remind ourselves that uh, placing people and the planet in peace over profit is not just a slogan, but has to be a political objective that's, that's realizable. Thank you.